Hi, thank, <clears throat> thanks for joining us. Um, uh, James was going to give us an introduction, but I think he's having audio issues, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just kick off and get started. Um, thank you for attending the course um, over the next uh, couple of days. Um, and I think you'll find it, hopefully find it really interesting and informative. So this morning to start with, um, I'll give you a brief introduction to C++, some of the um, sort of more notable features. And uh, then later on this morning, we'll cover off uh, classes, which um, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, C++ is an object of language. So uh, it, it's quite a key part of, of how we use C++. Can everybody hear me okay? And can everybody see the slides? If, if you can't, just, just let me know. Other one. Great. Okay, well, well, well there are set of assumptions um, that we need, you know, we have for, for the course, and uh, we've highlighted them here. You know, um, to learn C++, you know, you need to be a decent programmer, as it says here, you know, experience with another programming language. You'll also need to understand how to use the, the Unix shell, um, and um, you, sh you should have access to a terminal uh, in front of you with, uh, with, a, with an installed C++ compiler. Now, uh, we, we also <clears throat> uh, will provide um, access to, to Archer 2. There should have been uh, information sent out on that. Um, so just a couple of things on what, what, what we're not covering. Um, you know, as it says here, writing efficient software um, is, is really about choosing the right algorithmic approach to your to your problem. Um, um, and we're not, we're not we're not going to be looking at that in great detail. It's really, as I said, um, how to program in C++. So we're going, to, we're going to take a lower level approach and how to implement, as it says here, are patterns efficiently using the language. We do have plenty of other material on how you know, you, you can you can use the appropriate algorithm for your approach. For example, the EPCC has courses on parallel design patterns that we use in our NSC. Okay, so what what, what is scientific computing? Um, you know, in terms of both HPC and data science, um, we, we're generally dealing with a large amount, getting a large amount of data from memory into a processor, then doing something useful with it and then storing it again. And um, as it says here, this is why Fortran is still relevant, but it's also because there are a lot of codes have been written in Fortran and um, you know, it's great to, to reuse them. They've been tested, we know they work. We, the one thing about uh, writing software is we want, to, <clears throat> we, want, we want to reuse as much of the existing code or libraries that is there. However, um, what we're looking at here is, is how C++ is about building abstractions and uh, as it says here, composing them together so we'll talk about a few of these and give some sort of default rules to follow. C++ is, is, is a large language and we could spend, as it says here, a whole semester going through it. So we've, we've looked at some of the key features that will really help you to write what we call modern C++ programming for, for scientific computing particularly. We're not trying to teach you the whole language. Um, and uh, there are many different styles for, 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 for writing um, programs in C++. Um, and, and that would take a very long time if we want, we're, we're going to actually teach the whole language. So, so we're going to focus on the key things that are going to help you write your better codes. And as it says, please ask questions at any time. So um, C++ is a bit of a misunderstood monster. It, as I said, it's large um, and there are a lot of complexities in it. But there are also ways that we can we can we can use it that, that make our life a lot simpler, and, and we'll go through these as we go through the uh, the course. It's large, as I said. The C plus plus twenty standard is um, just over twenty pages. Oh, sorry, eighteen hundred pages. I wish it was only twenty pages. <laughs> eighteen hundred pages. So it is it is it is very large. It has many parts. It's based on C, so it's we've got we've got all the things we'd expect in the in the C programming language. Plus we have classes. We have other features called generics. Uh, we have Lambda functions, um, which kind of help us support sort of functional programming. 
We actually have exception handling, it's quite extensive, and there is a vast library. Um, one of the things that is, is um, I think, key about C++, when you look at all of these things and you actually look at the syntax and all the capability that's in the language, it's large and it, it, it can be quite, you know, you can dread it. It can be quite, you know, if you're nervous, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a programmer who's just coming to it, it can seem very daunting. And I think this quote's great. Um, you know, uh, C makes it easy to shoot yourself in the foot, but C++ makes it harder. But when you do, it blows your whole leg off. That's Bjorn Strauster, um, pardon my pronunciation, but the, the, the inventor, the designer, the developer of uh, uh, C++. Um, and some people refer to it as being expert friendly. So, <clears throat> as it says here, C++ is an octopus made by nailing extra legs onto a dog. And we have, <clears throat> we have a picture there of an octodog. Um, I think, I think this, is, this is quite true. Um, you know, uh, we, we've got a lot of flexibility, we've got a lot of capability, but it's built upon um, C++. Um, C uh, the underlying C programming language. But as it says, you can cut off some of these extra legs to get, get the right dog for your program. What it's about is, is about constraining some of the capabilities of C++ to, to actually uh, help you um, design and build your, 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 your software. Uh, somebody jokingly said, why is it called C++20? Well, because that's how many legs they had to nail um, to fix the octopus. However, with C++ plus plus 23 being defined, well, you know. So C++ is a general purpose language. It's, as I said, it's based on C, but it's inspired by Simula. And Simula is pretty old object-oriented language, but it had some very nice features. Um, and it's seen as the, effectively, the, the original um, object-oriented programming language. But really, it was around about simulation, hence the name. And um, by building these components that they then used in simulation, uh, you, you, you built your systems. And, and Bjorn Strauss was really taken with that for building systems. He felt that was a good way to go. And that, that's, that's how the classes and the kind of structure uh, arrived in C++. Um, as we say, it's flexible, uh, allowing developers to build abstractions. Actually, this flexibility is very powerful and allows you to effectively define a new language that describes your problem. We'll see this as we go through. There are some really um, very powerful features there that, that, that allow you to, to, to express, your, um, express your problem really well. Um, I think this is a key one, the third point, performance and efficiency are always targeted. You only pay for what you use. Yes, this is a key benefit. Um, we gain a large amount of functionality, but the language strives to make this as efficient as possible. We'll touch this uh, in the classy section later. And it has a powerful type system uh, to, as we say, to express intent. And we'll see this throughout the course. As it says, a bit like Frankenstein's monster, it's live. Um, it's a work in progress. Um, as it says, there's a, the, every three years, there's a new update to the international standard. The latest one that we're current, currently uh, uh, using is C++20. Um, but it's still not fully implemented by a compiler. Um, but the major new features are ranges, coroutines, uh, and modules, um, sort of actual proper module handling for C++. And I suppose if you, if you come from the Java world, it's, it's more akin to sort of what's there rather than include files. Can everybody still hear me? Um, somebody seems to be having a problem with the audio. Yeah, great. Perfect, thank you. Um, C++23 is still in draft, that's its uh, draft number there. Um, the major features likely uh, to include um, networking, more string formatting, uh, executors, and, and, and actually a consolidation of the new C++20 features. So these refer the references here are really quite useful. Um, just talking about the standards there, I, I, would, I would call out um, the fourth one down uh, on cppreference.com where it actually has a table of all the C, the, the C++ standard support. Um, so, um, you know, all the way from early versions through C++ 14, 20, and, and, and even 23, uh, you know, it, and it explains 
for, for, for each compiler what the level of support is. And that's quite important because you may be a feature that you think is quite nice in C++ and maybe the compiler you're using, I don't know, you might be using Intel C++, for example, you might find that that, that feature isn't available to you in that compiler. So it's actually, it's actually really useful because you can, you can have a look and you can see um, what level of support there is. C certainly, um, I, I would say uh, the C++14 and heading towards the C++20 support, there's, there's pretty much most of it there. And, and certainly from what we're doing in the course, um, it, it, they, they support everything that we'll be covering in the course. Um, a couple of other books. Um, the the Bjorn Strauss group um, book is pretty good. Ah, sorry, somebody just asked a question, which compiler uh, supports the most standard? Well, that, that, that's tricky. I, I think um, when, I, when I looked at it, I, I, think, I think actually GCC does at the moment. But I, 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 I'm willing to be corrected on that. But I think I think the latest or later versions of GCC are, are pretty compliant. And as uh, as James has pointed out, if if you have a look at that that page there, it will actually tell you. Um, one of the things I did want to to call out was that that CP, cppreference.com is really useful. It's a really great site, not just for this. Um, James is pointing out to scroll to the bottom of that page on the CPP reference. Um, but another book I'd, I'd, I'd really like to, to, to uh, mention is The Effect of uh, Modern C++ by Scott Mayers. As it says, it's, this is the book um, to, to find your way around C++. <clears throat> it's, it's saying that, you know, maybe once you know your way around it, you, you might want, you want to use this book. But I actually think it's quite good to get to um, when you start because it's got some really interesting features um, and, and, and concepts. Um, and although they might be a little bit challenging, um, if you're going to use C++ a lot, I think it would help, particularly around <clears throat> how to use some of the sort of more um, unique um, features of C++ and also the, the, the sort of object-oriented side of things. As we go through in classes, <clears throat> you'll see why actually um, they're, they're very useful. So as I say, I think, I think, that's, I think that's a good book to get. First, let's have a look at the ubiquitous um, hello world example in C++. And this is how we would compile it. So um, the key things to take away here are uh, the, the preprocessor runs first. So that's these include directives. If you're familiar with C, this is very familiar, but if you're not familiar with, with C, um, the, the, we have these include files that basically pull in other, other um, pieces of code or definition of constants, et cetera. And so they use a lot. This one is pulling an IO stream. Um, as we see here, the angle brackets say that it's actually a systems, a systems uh, header file and well, this will bring in the IO stream, which we're using here on the uh, in the main function. Uh, the standard colon colon C out is is the is the is is the standard out effectively. So that's how the the string is is being outputted. Um, what we see here is that um, every program uh, has to have a main function. So this this is this is effectively the entry point um, for the program. And um, this is, as it says, the compiler and OS arrange for this to be called when you run it. So you don't need to call it explicitly. It's effectively the start or the main. And when the, the binary gets loaded to memory uh, for execution, this gets called. Um, so um, one thing uh, I think to note here is that um, the return zero statement uh, indicates the operating system no error occurred. So if you're, if you're using Unix or Linux or, or, or some Unix-like operating system, um, you can you can ask when you run a, a binary, it will return a value, you can, and you can check that. Um, so we, you can then see whether your program's been successful, or you can return a status that you could use in your scripts or in another program to let you know what's actually happened within the program. As it, as it also says here, you can get the command line arguments, um, but the void statement here is, means we aren't using them.
Um, I'd, 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 also, I'd also mention that um, these re return values, the ret by returning zero, that just means everything's okay. That's the kind of default. Um, there are there are a number of different values you can get. They're defined in a in a in a uh, include file in C standard lib. Okay, looking at the code just a little bit a little bit further. Um, the standard, as it says here, is the library namespace. So namespaces, you can sort of, I suppose, you it mentions that you can see them as file system as you know, like like. Um, directories in the file system, but you could also see them a bit like how you would group things together to form effectively like a module. But it's it's where we would collect a set of of, of um, you know related functionality. The uh, the double colons is is what we call the, the scope resolution operator, and it allows us to access something from inside that namespace. So that's how we get at, we get we get a handle on this C out that, as I said earlier, represents the, the console output. And you know you might be you might be familiar with standard output uh, and also standard input. And um, to actually output the string, we we use these what what are effectively like, like the, the bitwise left shift operator, but it's it, we sometimes refer to them as as a streaming operator. Um, so and it and it and we output. Um, from almost from right to left, because what, what's happening here is we've got on the left, we've got where we want it to go. We're then uh, putting to that uh, st uh, standard out the hello world string. And then after that, we've got um, uh, an end line uh, character, which is again in, in the standard in the standard library. Another thing to note here is that every state in the C++ must be terminated with a semicolon. And uh, the language treats all white space, um, you know, spaces, tabs, line breaks as the same. Is that okay? Uh, uh, am I going too fast, or or or, or, or are people quite happy? If, if if not, just just call out. Okay. So one of the things we we. We mentioned it was that um, we're, we're going to, you know, actually want to be compiling the code. So, um, as it says here, you can use your laptop. Uh, that actually says service at the top of the of, of the uh, of the slide. There, it should be Archer two. You should you should have login details. So, if you're logging into Archer two, once you're logged in, you'll need to load the up to date compilers, and that that's done using this module load command. So that will load. Uh, GCC uh, version 10.2. There are later versions of GCC and Archer, but that's the default version. If you use a command module spider GCC, it will list the different uh, the different versions of GCC if you're interested. If you um, you need to get the source code, um, that's available on GitHub at that location there. Um, and you can also see the, the slides and the other materials in the browser by actually going to the, the website of, of, of the, arc, of the um, repository. If you need to get a copy of the exercises, that's the command there. It's git clone and then uh, uh, the, the website with Archer 2 there. And then once, you, once it's downloaded it, you can go into the uh, Archer 2 lectures CPP intro hello directory. And then you can use your editor to edit the whole CPP file. And uh, that's the command line, certainly, on Archer to uh, compile, or using G++, to compile uh, the program. So note, we're, we're using the minus minus standard C++11 uh, option, compiler option, because that's the you know, we're going to use some features from that standard onwards. Then the uh, next, right. Uh, then the next um, uh, part is the name of the file, the source file, and uh, minus O is for output, and that's the binary. So that 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 gives us the name of the binary. If you don't do that, it'll give us an A dot out. Um, another thing to, I think while we're here, just to note, um, is uh, by I was going to say 
by default, but but actually by convention, uh, we name our C++ source files using .cpp for C++. Um, and if we're developing header files, which we will be, uh, we refer to them as .hpp. You can use other extensions, but these are these are pretty much the, the standard ones that, that, that people use. And by using those, if your editor understands how to do syntax highlighting, it'll do it because it, it, it'll note the extension and then be able to, 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 to highlight the syntax for C++. So I, I, if, you've, if you've got an opportunity to, it, it take, takes no time at all to compile it, so it might be worth giving it a go. And as it says here, um, if, you, um, if you get no, out, uh, no output um, when, when you're doing the compilation step, then that means success. That means you have no errors and it's compiled. And, and you should, in the same directory, see uh, a, a file called hello without an extension, and that should be your, your, your binary, and you can run it just using dot slash hello. Don't know if anybody's tried it and that had any problems. If you have, just, just, just raise your hand, post a note. Okay. We'll press on. So another very useful tool is um, is the uh, is the compiler explorer, um, which is uh, available here at uh, godbolt.org. It's actually named after the, uh, the, the the guy who wrote it. Uh, the great thing about the compiler uh, explorer is that you can put some C++ code on the left and it will be compiled with a lot of, you know, there's, a, there's a large number of compiler versions you can choose and you will see the errors and warnings and reports. Um, and you'll actually also be able to see the, ex, the generated binary code um, on the right hand side. Uh, I, I, I use it because I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of work with RISC-V and so um, it's quite useful for me to see what's actually been generated um, on these new uh, processes. Just see some comments here. Yes, that's right. It inserts a it inserts a the question there about um, the end and end line character. It, it effectively does a flush. It's very similar to if you're using C, standard C, if you just did a, a backslash N inside your printf statement. So as I say, the, um, Godbolt is a, is, is, is a really good, um, is a really good website and it's very useful and you can get shareable links. So you could, you could share your code. If you've got some issues, you could share that with somebody. So uh, I, I really highly recommend having a look at it. Okay, um, C++ is a, is, a, is a typed language. So all var variables must be declared. Um, so, and um, generally, uh, you know, you, you, you would give it the type, but you can, you can ask the compiler to figure it out. And um, it also counts from zero like C or Python, as one would expect have, uh, since it's based on C and it doesn't, you know, unlike Fortran where it you know, counts from one. So a variable is, is, is an object or a reference. And um, we'll talk about references later. Um, we will cover those. And the key thing about these is that they're declared to have a type and a name. So we refer to them. We refer to them actually as objects. And and by objects here, I don't 
I don't mean um, classes or an instance of a class. I mean, in a generic term, it's, it's a, a region of storage, uh, an area of memory that um, has a type, um, it has a size, there's a value and a lifetime. And um, whilst, you know, we might expect the type is, um, is, is important because that, uh, how, how that, that determines some of the operations we do upon it, the, in C++, the lifetime is also important because we, we have to manage memory. We have to manage that ourselves. It's, it's, not, it's not done for us in the same way that maybe Python or a, or, or a, or a, or a language with a garbage collector like um, Java would, would, would manage. So uh, the question is, this is the same as allocate and deallocate in Fortran. Um, yes, when I'm talking about the life cycle of, of an object, um, we, you can have dynamically created objects, and you can also have um, objects that are managed on this, effectively what we call on the stack, and they will be created and, and these will be destroyed for you automatically. Um, we'll touch on this in a little bit later. We do talk more about what we do with me the, 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 um, with uh, regards memory management in uh, a later part of the course. Um, for, for this morning, we'll, we'll, we'll just cover the sort of key elements that make up C++ so that you've got a, a grounding to allow you to, to, to deal with these other, um, these, these other concepts. But yes, in a sense, there, there are, there, there can be dynamically created memory that can be destroyed, but there's also statically created uh, um, objects rather um, that, 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 uh, that can be passed around in and out of functions and, and they can be managed. But we'll touch upon that as we go through. So uh, as I sort of said, um, C++ is statically typed and um, these restrictions and per permitted operations are a key part of the language. Um, so it's, 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 it's important that we, we, we understand um, typing and, and, and what the implications of that are. There are sort of a set of fundamental types. Um, as it says here, void is nothing. Um, it, it's like you're looking into the void, as, you know, there's nothing there. Um, it's used to indicate a function takes and or returns no value, um, which, which, which is correct. Uh, we have a bool, which is a true or false. We have a series, a, a good number of, of different uh, integer types. Um, Int here, it says, is, is a standard sign one for your machine. It's the standard says it's at least 16 bits and it's usually 32 bits. Then we have floating point numbers. We have single and double precision. And uh, as it says, it's usually an IEEE 754 64 bit number. Then C++, these, these would be familiar to, um, well, certainly the void and, and doubles would be familiar to you if you use C. But um, C++ also, because of um, um, has an, an, a set of additional types like the standard byte, which is raw and type memory. So we, we would use that to, to create a region of memory that we might want to, to put other certain data in and, 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 and use in different ways. There are also unsigned versions of the integer types, um, which, which, which is useful if, if we're not interested in the sign, then we, we, can, we, we, can, we can use that. Um, and the, uh, this, the stand, C standard int header provides a different set or a, or a number, as I mentioned, of fixed with integer types based on the implementation. So as it says, the standard int 32, standard int 64, et cetera. And um, these coupled with um, doubles versus you know, floats, which are single precision, allow you to optimize uh, memory usage. So you can make the decision based on, on uh, the, the, the system you're writing that, that you, know, um, you can allocate uh, the right amount of memory, if you like, uh, for your data structures, um, allowing you to um, reduce the memory footprint rather than say, uh, for example, if you don't need to use a 64-bit int and you know that the values you've got are going to sit in a you know, uh, possibly in a 32-bit int or even smaller, then you would tend to use those if you've got a large array of them because it's going to save you some, it's going to save you money, memory and all But um, CPP reference is also a great place to find out more information about the, the types that are in C++. So 
So C++ also has strings um, and has a standard library that um, allows us to, uh, you know, um, declare and use strings. Um, however, in, 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 in C++ in the standard library, the, the, the character coding is, is a little bit of a mess due to, to Unicode support, but it's partially fixed in C++ 20, um, which, is, which is good. Um, so, you know, it's, it's making things, things better. But if you need to do a lot of complex text handling, it's, it's really best to use a library such as Boost, um, because working with Unicode's Unicode strings directly is is non-trivial. Okay, let's have a look at, at the functions um, and uh, the, the, the salient features of, of declaring functions and using functions. So we have two functions here. We have a function say hello and uh, a function uh, name. Um, and you de first declare the function by giving it its return type. So as we see in say hello here, it's void, um, which means it's not going to it's not going to return any any value. And um, then we also give a list of zero more parameters. And again, here we've used void inside the the round brackets here to indicate we're not taking any parameters. You don't have to put it in, but but by putting it in, it makes it quite clear that um, you're, you're not passing any, any parameters here. I, I think it makes it clear when you look at your code. And then um, if, as I said, if the parameter list is zero, then we put void in. Um, if the function doesn't return a value, then um, as I mentioned, it's void. Otherwise it would be the return type as we see in main here of the actual uh, return value. I've just mentioned that, as we said, uh, declare the return and parameter types. Um, so yes, parameters are effectively local variables that are initialized by the caller. So when you call a function and you pass parameters, effectively they become um, variables in uh, the scope or the body of uh, the, the function. As we see here in the int function, where we've got uh, integer a and integer b being passed in, Effectively, we, we, we access those and they, and, and they behave because of the nature of the way they are declared on the stack, they, they, we see them as local variables. And another thing that's important to uh, note here, when, when we talk about the return value, we use this return statement, hence the, uh, the, the name return value, the type of the expression, so in, in this one here, uh, A plus B, it, it has to be convertible um, to the declared return type. And by that, what we're meaning is that the C++ compiler must be able to coerce, is, is the term we would use, or convert the result of the expression to this return type. In other words, um, you know, if, if we had declared uh, the return type as a float, um, it could convert from integer to a float. Um, and as we'll see later, there are certain things that we we can coerce um, and uh, convert, and there are certain uh, variable types or types that we can't. But C++ um, has the opportunity for us to create our own types, as we'll see, and um, you know uh, actually allow us to define functions to do to do that that um, conversion. Here we also see um, at the bottom there um, the use of the auto keyword which asks the compiler to determine of the type from uh, what follows, um, which it can be from us telling it later. So for example here, the arrow int just before the brace at the end of the line, let's look at, is it, is it affect a, 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 another um, form of the, of the syntax um, to tell the compiler that uh, we're turning an int. Um, there, we'll cover the use of auto more um, in a moment, um, and actually, it, it's it's quite a nice sy syntax because when you see that arrow, you know that's the return value. To use a function or or, or apply it or call it, um, we, we we just give it its name and 
uh, provide the, the arguments in parentheses. So as we see here, um, to call sum, we just basically use the name sum and the brackets and pass the parameters, we, you know, the, the arguments we want to pass, uh, x and 100. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with that from other programming languages. It's, it's pretty much the same, the same, same, same model. Um, it, it is important to note that the, the parameters of the function must match the declaration. So we, you know, if there are two parameters, we need we, uh, from for, for the moment, if there, um, uh, I, I'll say that if there are two parameters, that you should pass the parameters, and they need to be of types that can be, as I said, converted or coerced. Um, in this main function here, we've got to return zero, which I mentioned earlier was to to um, basically tell the operating system that the, the program is run correctly. That's the default value. You don't actually have to uh, put a return zero or a return value into uh, a main uh, function uh, in C++ um, as that effectively that, that'll be done for you. Um, so you, by default, you don't need to do a return zero. But however, um, all other functions, you do need to return a value if you have declared it with a with a return type that's that that, that isn't void. So we can, as we see here, we can actually have multiple functions with the same name but different types. So we have two versions of of, of the sum function here. We've got uh, one that takes uh, two integers and returns an integer, and we've got one that takes uh, two doubles and returns a double. Um, and as it says, the compiler will um, know what types of arguments you're passing to sum and will try and find the best match for all the candidates with the name. So in other words, it will look at all the, all the functions you've defined called sum, and it will try and pick the best one. Yeah. And as I said, it will use um, type coercion rules, uh, you know, to try and or and conversion rules to 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 actually call the the the, the most appropriate function. So if we look at this example, um, it'd be good to 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 see well what actually would happen here if we try to compile this. This is assuming that in the same piece of code or, or elsewhere, we, we've actually defined these two sum uh, functions. So certainly the, 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 the sort of first line we've got there with the C out um, sum i1 and i2, well, that, that, that should compile fine. We've got, we've got a version of, of sum that takes two integer parameters. Likewise, the one below should, with three and 72 should be, should be fine. We might uh, have an issue with the next line. Can anybody th think why that might be the case? Actually, that one's fine. It's the um, the one I was thinking of is a D two I one, and the reason there is the compiler will will give an error because we're passing a double and an integer, and it's it's not able to uh, find the the correct candidate. So actually, GCC will give you an error. It says call of overloaded function double and in, is ambiguous, and it, it said there's two candidates, but it can't find a matching one for that. Likewise, um, the sum uh, uh, call at the bottom there with name and file where it's being passed to strings um, is is uh, will fail because we we haven't we haven't created a function with that takes for some that takes two strings, but also um, the compiler isn't able to uh, coerce a string to either an int or a um, double, and it'll it'll let you know that by saying um, something along the lines of no known conversion for argument string, you know, and it gives you the function. And likewise, it'll do the same thing for, for double. So we do have to think about types, as I said, um, it, 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 it can do some of the coercion for some of the types, but um, for others, it won't. And the compiler will then 
will then let you know. However, an interesting thing we have in C++ is we can extend the language effectively and um, we can create operator functions. And it, this example here is showing the example of adding a, a, a plus operator to the string. And then we can use the natural syntax, as we see below, um, where we are adding um, the username Alice and we're, we're, we're appending um, the .csv and returning a new string um, with uh, the contents of that in data file. Note we've used the, the auto there again. And effectively what's happening there is the um, auto data file uh, line, uh, the compiler is using what we call type inference. It's working out that what's on the right hand side of that equal sign is a string, a standard string, and it will, de it, it will declare the uh, data file as a standard string. Actually, we, we, we generally would recommend that we use auto, um, you know, and the reason for this is um, the syntax means that we, we, we can't have initialized value because we, we, the compilers in having to infer the type um, for you, you have to give it a value that then it can infer that type from. And as I say here, it can infer it because it's a string. So it's actually, it's, it's actually quite good to use auto because it allows us then to make sure that every value, uh, sorry, every variable has an initialized value. Okay, so I think it'd be good um, we, we, uh, to, to, to write some, some code and we, we can go through it. What I'd like you to do is to have a look at this uh, section of code and um, change the function say hello to accept um, a name read from the terminal and then create a new message um, saying hello, whatever the person's name is, and print it to standard output. Um, as you can see here, there is an example of how you can read a string from standard input. Welcome back. I hope everybody had a good short break. Um, and we'll get started on classes in a minute. There was a good discussion around auto, particularly with regards um, the standard string in the chat there. And actually, it's it's quite it's quite uh, quite opposite as we're as we're now going to talk about classes. One the the, the reason um, so the, one of the, the points I highlighted earlier with regards using auto was to make sure that you initialize the variable with a value and you know there were there were there were some questions around well it doesn't in effect it doesn't seem to make a difference with string you know whether whether you use the auto keyword or not and and that that's the reason the reason behind that really is that string is a class um and um when uh, we use auto we're forced to use the braces and even though that's going to give us an empty string, we're still initializing it. And we're initializing it with an empty string, which is the same thing as what would happen with a, what we'll call a default constructor when we create a string. So it's slightly confusing, but that's that's really the reason is because because it's a class, okay? But I, we'll, we'll see more of this as, as we talk through classes now. I'm just checking again that everybody can hear me fine. If not, just let me know. Great, thank you. Okay, I think it, we, we, a lot of people will be familiar with C++ um, or, or, you know, when people talk about C++, tend to refer to it as an object-oriented language, which is absolutely true, it is. But one of the things to think about with regards uh, objects or classes we we define classes that then we create instances of which are called objects um but 
but actually classes um, are in effect, as it says here, um, we call them class types. So really, um, we, we can think of classes as new types. So in the same way as we've got integers and floats and um, doubles, etc., cetera, um, we can create new types um, that can, uh, you know, uh, support what we're, what, what we're trying to uh, work with or compute or what our problem is. And as we see here, we, we're, we're declaring a complex number, which has got the two elements, uh, the real and uh, the imaginary. If you've done C, that, that, that will be familiar. That's identical to how you declare a struct or what is actually short for structured type um, in C. And obviously, because C++, as I said, um, was originally, uh, if you like, an extension of C. In fact, the, ver the first version of the C++ compiler uh, was, a, was what we called a, a preprocessor that then compiled down to C. But that aside, the, 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 syntax, the syntax is very similar here. But we'll also see how C++ extends this and um, effectively gives us a lot more flexibility, a lot more capability over just uh, the structured types that we have in, have in C. Mention again um, that uh, we, we've, we, we can see this on the Compiler Explorer. So if you were to click in the link there, uh, you will actually see this example. Um, we've also referred to this as a plain old type or a trivial type. Um, You'll, you'll, you'll hear people refer to um, these structs as that, in the sense that really what we're doing here is we've just got several members and we have a name and a type, but they're collected together so we can declare a variable of it and we can also declare parameters to a function of this type and we can effectively pass them around. So we can, you know, we 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 can pass these two values uh, in in one in one uh, object bearing in mind when we're talking about object here, we're talking about general um, uh, C++, um, variables, etc., rather than uh, objects, which are instances of classes. So to create them, um, it's, 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 it's fairly straightforward here. Once we once we define complex as we saw above, um, we can uh, create them using um, the uh, braces. And this is called the aggregate initialization. Now, what, what, what is important here is that the order of the variable or the values rather inside that aggregate initialization must, must be in the correct order. Um, or, or you must understand the order, um, uh, you know, of, of, of the uh, of the type. So in this example here, we're creating we've got a function um, which uh, make imaginary unit, which takes no parameters, hence it's void, and returns a complex number. And as we see, it returns a complex number with uh, the real value of zero and the imaginary value of one. That's the simplest way to do it. Um, it's 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 fairly clear if you understand. The, as I say, the ordering of, of those um, tri um, those uh, uh, members, but you can also you can also um, use an alternative uh, syntax, um, as we see here, where we uh, create a complex number, the square root underscore m1, and that's uninitialized, uh, and then we initialize the values before we return it, and so therefore we dereference or access the um the the members uh, using the dot there and assigning the value to it so um you know the real value is assigned to zero in that line square root underscore m1 dot re and the same for the imaginary then we return the initialized value that's exactly what you would do in most c codes that that, that that's the the kind of fairly standard way of doing it in, in traditional c or old c So we can access them and uh, update them. So 
you know, in, in the same manner. So, so similar to the, the, the previous slide, here, here we're creating a, a complex variable z, and uh, we're calling the function, and we're getting a new object being, a, a new type being um, returned to z, and then we're um, calling this a cert function, which is really, it's, well, it's actually set macros, but it, it's effectively a, a function that um, tests the conditions inside the brackets. And if they're not satisfied, then it will throw an error and an error message. So it's quite and stop execution. So it's 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 a useful it's a, it's a useful way of testing certain critical pieces of our code. So here we want to assert that um, the real value is equal to zero, um, and and as and also um, assert that the imaginary value is equal to one. And as I said, the the assert the assert um, function is is very useful. And a key point here is that um, any any piece of code, as shown here, can access the member variables inside the object, um, inside this this what was declared with a struct. And as we'll see, um, we might want to control that. So here we, we've. We, we've got the example um, for complex. And as it says, we should provide default values for member variables. Generally, for certain types, it's good practice to make sure we initialize everything. It's, it, in, we really want to make sure that every, every um, object we create um, or variable we create has a value. And we can see we're doing that here with uh, giving these default values inside the struct um, definition. And so therefore we know that it's going to be actually, when we come to use it, we know that it's actually going to be initialized properly. Now we've said shoot here in, in, in brackets and um, you might, might say, well, why is it shoot and not must? Well, it's certainly, as I said, it, it's good practice and also the compiler will generate the code to actually uh, set those values for us, and we can't forget to do it. So when we get that complex number in the uh, in the test function there, although we're asserting that re is equal to zero and i is equal to zero here, um, they will be because that's what they've been set to in the in the uh, definition or definition of, of of struct. And so we 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 can we can we can be assured that that's the case. Okay, you might say, well, that, we should do that all the time. Well, there might be times when you don't want to do this. So if your types are, are like a built-in type, so effectively complex number is like a, you know one of the other um, types, as I mentioned earlier, um, then that's fine. But it could be that the type you're creating um, has a large data structure within it that um, has a significant runtime cost when you when you when you initialize it, and you may not want to pay uh, that runtime cost at that point. In which case, you might not um, initialize it at that point. But generally, I would say where you can and where it's um, not a major overhead, you should you should you should initialize everything. So, when with some of the standards, we we certain features actually get taken away as as well as being added. So, um, as it says here, with C plus plus eleven, we lose the ability to set the member variables just for providing the values. So what we get in GCC is uh, that error message down there saying no matching constructor constructor sorry for the initialization of complex, where we're doing that return and we're setting the values. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. See why this is, and what we can do about it in a minute. So, what we can do is we can define uh, a, a set of ways to control the, the creation of instances of your classes. These are these are called constructors. Now, um, there are default constructors. And we can see that an instance of that there in in the uh, the, the, the new definition for complex. And as I'm, 
alluded to or mentioned earlier, string has a default constructor as well. So, so many types will have a default constructor, which may just um, initialize them to uh, an empty value or some valid value, some value that makes sense. Um, but we can also declare our own uh, constructors. And as we can see here, we've, we've, we've got um, one that uh, uses just the real value, uh, one that takes the real and imaginary value. And as I mentioned before, a default constructor, which takes no arguments. And um, the, the, the compiler will, will do that on our behalf by using that equals default. So we don't, we don't need to actually go ahead and declare that. We, it, 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 it will create it for us. So we can get quite a bit of um, quite a bit of uh, flexibility in how we create objects, and when you build more complex classes, um, the constructors that you provide become very very um, important, um, and, and and we'll see that as we go through. So one thing to note here is that if you create um, other constructors, so if, if, if we provide our own, like the, uh, the two double um, uh, constructors, one for the, the real and one for the real and imaginary, then uh, the um, standards of the language states that we also have to provide a default, uh, default one. Um, and so therefore we have to provide that, but we can just say default. So that, that would be this, that would be, if you remember back to um, the last session when we were talking about, sorry, there was a question there that was asking, can you define a constructor complex double IM or is it identical? Um, it, 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 it's identical because the compiler is going to work it out based on the type, okay? So that's another thing you need to be aware of, yeah? Um, it won't be able to switch per se on the name. It, 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 it's the type that it's actually, it's actually doing the, the, the switching to, to call the right function or what we call the polymorphism. Okay. So constructors look a bit like functions, but in a sense they're they're not they're, they're not functions because um, they're not directly callable. Also, which might seem slightly surprising, but constructors don't return a value, and um, they they're they're there to do initialization. Well, they, they can do more than that. There are a number of things you can do in constructors that are beneficial, um, but they 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 can do initialization of member variables. Um, before the body ex, uh, begins execution. Now, this, this is important. And um, you can see here in the two examples that after the complex, uh, um, what I would call the protocol of the function, or signature of the function rather, which is the double real, there's a colon. And then we see the um, member name and um, we're, we're actually setting it to the value of the parameter being passed in. So that's, that's how we can take um, a parameter, pass it into a, a, a constructor, and then um, we uh, set it in the, um, in, 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 in the, we set the, the member variable to it before we enter the body of the constructor. Um, that becomes important for certain codes where um, there may be things going on inside the, um, the, the actual body of the function. Plus, also, if you put them there, if anything was to fail in the function, the, the, the you know, um, we, 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 these, these, these should still be initialized. And ideally, this is where we really should do most of our initialization, if as much as possible, um, for the reasons I've just I've just outlined. So now we can create complex numbers in, a, you know, in, in different ways. Um, we can, as we can see, we, we can we can 
use the default initializer. And that's that that that's going back to the the, the point I made earlier about that the discussion we had on string. Um, and or we can give it a value as we do there with with, with pi. And uh, we've got another example where we we, we pass the two the the the, the, the two uh, member member fields. There's a lot to think about um, with regards when you're designing your classes and what you do with constructors, but um, there are a number of good texts that would that will help you um, that you can find online that will help you with your object oriented design. I'll, I'll mention it now um, because I think it's quite a good book for how you design particular ob object um, object hierarchies or how you do uh, you know design object oriented systems. It's quite an old book and it's it's relatively pricey, but it's called I'll I'll stick a link in in the um, in the chat area later, but it's called Object Oriented Design Heuristics by Arthur J. Real. And you know, a lot of the what they call heuristics in there um, are quoted by other people or are specified, you know, other people do call out these these kind of heuristics, basically guidelines, things you should do. But the arguments for why you should follow these these heuristics are quite clear in the book. They're and they are actually quite good at helping you to understand good object-oriented design, but also just object-oriented design more generally because of the, 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 the explanations that go with it. So it's, it's quite a good book. And as I say, he, he, he covers um, constructors as well as what you do with regards to member functions, which we're now about to talk about. So this is a quote from uh, Wikipedia. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, an object may not necessarily be uh, uh, an object in the OOP sense, but um, object-oriented programming or OOP is based on the concept of objects which uh, contain data and code. Um, a feature of objects is that the object's procedures can access and modify the data of the objects with which they are associated. I'd also reiterate that a class is um, effectively uh, the, the, the template, if you like, um, that describes uh, what the type is and the object is the instance of it and i know we've used struct earlier um, but there is also the class keyword they are very they're very similar the, the differences is that between them is with regards what we call the default privacy of the uh, of the of the member variables and, and methods but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that and as i said in c plus um the functions that we attach to the type or the, or the object or class um, are known as member functions. Um, more often, they're called methods, but I, I actually prefer member functions. Um, I think it's clearer that uh, what, what, what they are. So an example we've got uh, down here um, in this main function, if we look at the uh, C outline, Similar to what we saw before, we're, we're printing out a, a string with a name, but we can also ask name because name is a string, which is a class is is an object of class string, um, and has a member variable, uh, sorry, a member function called size. Um, we we can ask it what its size is. So you, you heard me slip up there between member variable member fun um, member function, but you know, in a sense, that's a good thing because uh, we know what member variables are. These are the, this is the data that we're storing in it, and um, the, the member functions are are the are the functions that we can call on that on 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 that particular object. And typically, um, these are declared in the what we call the class definition. Now, I mentioned earlier that the um, the kind of convention for uh, C++ file names is .cpp for, 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 for our main sort of uh, code and for our header files, we refer to them as HPP. So the, the comment here is, is, is indicating that we're actually going to put this um, definition inside a header file. That means 
And the advantage of that is we can then load that header file into multiple different CPP files and access the definition. Um, but, but here we can see how we are declaring complex. And now we've added a member function um, called magnitude, which returns a double. Now you'll notice it's also got const at the end of it, um, but we'll cover const in more detail later. But they also can be, um, member fun um, functions can also be uh, defined as it says out of line. So now you can see the comment, that's the double slashes there, that this is being declared or defined in, in um, the main CPP file rather than the header. And it's, and it's no longer part of the, uh, the, 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 the type definition. And we're not, so to actually define it separately like this, we have to use that um, namespace qualifier that we, we, we looked at earlier. And in this case, that's the complex colon colon. So when we say co complex colon colon magnitude here, we're referring to the magnitude that's, that's defined here. So this is how we do it out of line. And we're um, declaring function. And as we can see, it's, it's using the standard, the square root function in the standard library um, on the real and imaginary, imaginary rather, um, uh, member variables. So another key point to take away here is that we we can we can access the members of the um, of, of 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 the class or object by just giving their names. And um, this is. This is, this is because the compiler, in when we declare these member functions, uh, the compiler inserts an implicit uh, argument referring to the instance for us so that we can reference these fields, RE and IM. The reference is actually known as the, this pointer um, and can be used directly, but we'll discuss this later. Um, what I'll actually do is I'm just gonna stick in the chat a reference to uh the this pointer um on that website which gives a bit more information however uh, really we don't want to we'd really rather not use pointers for 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 a number of reasons um and um generally you should just you should just use the implicit reference that's that that's given to you um here so that you you don't actually use the this pointer directly but just in case you are more interested in it um, that link will give you a bit more inf information how it works. Effectively, what happens, every member function, the first parameter is the this pointer and it's hidden from you, but it's actually passed as the first parameter. So magnitude is effectively uh, a pointer to complex uh, and then nothing else. So um, in the, the example there at the bottom, it says uh, outside the class, um, we uh, Create an instance, and then we can we can we can uh, you know um, access the uh, the function. So that function um, is that member function is accessed by first creating the, the complex number with some values, and then we can call it. So. One key and very powerful and important uh, feature of um, C++ classes um, is the ability to create operators, um, which are, or, which are uh, you know, functions, member, member functions. But um, as you see here in the example, we can have a plus equals or a plus or a, a multiplier divide. So we can actually make, you know, make them behave and uh, in the same manner as, um, you know, our, 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 our simpler types or what are commonly referred to as base types in the language, that's our ints, our, our doubles and our floats. So when we create a complex number, we can create a completely new type and then we can assign or we can declare, define these, these um, member functions 
for the operators so that in our code, we can, we, we can use them in the same way as we'd use our base types. Which I think is not, is not only, uh, you know, very powerful, but it actually allows us to effectively uh, use C++ to describe a language for our problem. So we can create a set of types that, that help us with our problem, in this case, a complex number. And then we can, we can, we can define a set of operators, which then um, allow us to use it in the same way as we, we might do if we were just writing it down ourselves. So I think it's, it, it, it's something that's incredibly powerful and, and very useful in C++. So the example here is just creating two, two, um, two uh, operators. Um, one is in line, the first one, which is the, this is in line, yeah, um, which is the plus equals. And then we've got another one. Um, no, I'm misreading that. I, I, my apologies. It's just the, the, the spacing there. They're both actually in line inside of the com, um, complex. And so one, one's doing a plus equals. Um, and then the other one is just doing a plus as we see. And the second one is actually re re returning a new complex number um, uh, initialized with um, the, 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 the additions that, that are there. The plus equals is returning the same instance, the same object, but it's, 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 it's appending or it's, it, you know, it's adding um, to the real and imaginary numbers. And as we, as we see here, it says um, the plus equals is using the implicit this pointer. So what it's doing is returning um, the, the, this pointer points to this current instance, as I said. So if we declared uh, a complex number Z, if we said complex Z, um, and then we went we, inside this function, this, this, this pointer would be referring to that Z instance. So, um, you, you need to use these, um, the, the implicit this pointer to implement this particular um, operator. But as I said, generally, and as you see, as we go on, we generally don't really want to be manipulating pointers directly. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll come to const later. We'll talk a bit more about, so somebody's asking um, about, could, could we talk more about const and when to use it? Well, we'll actually co cover that later. All, all I would say at the moment here is, um, there's two things that are in this slide um, that, that we will cover later, um, is consts and references. So um, the reference is that ampersand. And so basically what we're saying here in the, the plus equals operator is we're taking um, another co complex object and um, that's what we're going to use to increment, but we're taking a reference to it, which as we'll see means it's, it's more efficient. And um, we're also, by, by passing it with the const um, uh, keyword, we can't modify it. So we're not going to change increment, which is fine in this example, because we just want to get its value. We don't want to, we don't want to change it. But as I said, we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, we, we can now use the natural syntax to, to add these values. Um, as we see there, we create um, a complex number Z uh, and we've created one I and given it the value zero and one. And then we use the, uh, the syntax Z plus equals I, which means we'll increment the values in Z with those contained within I. And then we can call an assert uh, statement or function there and check the values of what we expect. And we can also we can also uh, we can we can we can also declare a new a new complex number c um, by by saying well c equals z plus i, um, which again going back to our, our our discussion earlier about auto is nice here because we don't need to worry about it being what comp you know what what the what the type is that we're going to get because we will automatically be returned a complex uh, uh, variable a, a, a complex object. Um, because Z and I are uh, both complex, and when when they perform the plus operation, they return another complex. Uh, 
the question there, I guess the divide is uh, slash not divide. Um, yes, I would think so. I, I'm not quite sure with divide. I would need to check exactly what it is, but I, I would guess that it's plus and eight, uh, minus, I, I would think it would be slash. I, I haven't, shows my ignorance, I haven't, I haven't used operator overloading for, for doing division which I know for scientific codes is, 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 is very usual. Um, I have to say my background is not scientific codes. So, so I would tend to, I'm, I, I come from more of an enterprise software development background. So we would use operator overloading differently. We would, we would, an example I'd give you, you might create a date and you might create a time object and you might create a date time object, which we get two together. If you add a date and a time, you end up with a date time, I, you know, so, um, Thanks, Juan. Yes, I, I thought it probably was the slash. So, so um, that's another just a, as as, a, as as an aside. That's the other thing you can do with um, classes that that's quite important is that you can you can you, you you can put some rules around things by how you define how these operators work. So, as I give an example there, when you added a, a time object to a date object, you ended up with a date time object because it now needs to contain both. When the date didn't have uh, didn't have a time element of it, and the time object didn't have a date element of it, that's what happens when you you concatenate them or, or add them rather. And 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 so, you know, you can create this by what type you return. In this case, because we're adding, you want to add two complex numbers, we end up with a complex number. But there may be examples where, maybe for division, for example, you don't end up with with the with the with the same type as the two operands, if that makes sense. But that can all be defined by you. And, um, you know, that, that that's one of the benefits of, of being able to use these. Yes, so. Um, just, just to answer your your question, Joshua, I think it, I think it's just the predefined ones. I'm not sure you would be able to define dot because dot. Um, in fact, you won't be able to define dot because dot is actually part of the C++ language, which you use to access member variables or you know elements of a struct. So um, I can't see that you'd be able to overload that because then what does what what, what does z.re mean? Does it mean a product or does it, you know, am I doing a dot product or am I dereferencing the RE element of Z? So I don't think you can do it. I wouldn't imagine you can. In fact, I'm, I'm sure you can't. Yeah, so if you want to, if you want to know more about the actual um, operators, because there's a quality as well, then look them up on c++reference.com. It, it has them there. Um, I will also add that you can also create things called casting operators that allow you to, well, that perform a function when um, a type is being coerced or converted to another one. So it can actually do that conversion for you. So I'm not saying it's a good example. I'm just giving it as an example. It may be that we want to convert uh, a complex number to a real number. And in that case, um, a floating point number, rather a float or a double. And in that case, we might not use the imaginary. What we'll actually do is just return the real element of it. You could write a casting operator that would do that for you so that when you assign it to a double or a float, it would then extract the real uh, value and, 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 and return that. So there's even more power in what you can do by what you can do with casting operators. The only thing I would say about that is they're quite advanced. And if you're not careful, you can take a complex object that suddenly resolves down to or, or converts down to an int and your program fails for some reason because um, it's done all the implicit conversions for you. C++ is very good at doing them. And so it will co constantly try to find ones that it can and you end up with something that doesn't mean very much. So you have to be a little careful when you do when you do use those. And as I said, I think they're they're advanced. But in certain cases, certainly for, I would say, for, for more uh, types like, um, a bit like complex numbers, then they can be useful. And as I said, um, you know, I think, I think it's also good. We use it a lot here, this assert, um, you know, statement um, to, to do a test, I think is, is a good way of test, checking things.
So as I mentioned earlier, um, you can uh, define a class using either the struct or class keywords. And, uh, and as I said, it, it, the, the, the only difference is the accessibility of members. So what do we mean by accessibility? Well, members, that means, now when we mean members here, back to member variables, so the data and member functions, so the, the functions or methods as you might be you know, familiar with from other languages, um, they can be public. So in other words, any piece of code can um, can access them and that's the default for struct so everything is public and if you don't put any of if you don't put either private public or there's another one called protected in your in your in your definitions then everything in a struct will be public um, private is only available to um, the the class itself or the when the object's created the the object can only access its own internal representation, nothing else can, can access it. Um, so as, as, as the slide's really kind of calling out here, what, what we use this for is, is to create um, an interface to a class or type where um, we create an interface, which we define using public, and then we have the implementation, which is private, and, and by doing this, we can create encapsulation, which is a key part of object oriented programming, where um, the data is protected from access via a set of member variable, uh, member functions or, or methods. And we can define what that interface is. Again, by restricting the access, um, we can create a, not just control, but we can, we, we, we can set down a set of rules that the users of that class or type um, then have to follow. So we've got an example here where we've got a class and um, we've actually used the class um, keyword rather than struct. So the default privacy here is private. So that means that the string greet and the, uh, the member function say hello are actually private. So when we call um, in the function test g dot say hello, that, that, that should fail because um, you'll get a, a compiler error that says um, something along the lines of, you know, say hello is a private member of Greeter. So at compile time, not not runtime, but compile time, the compiler knows the the the, the privacy of these um, members of of the class and can raise an error. So you don't you know you don't have to wait to runtime for this for this to happen. This will actually happen when you compile it, which is great. So to fix it. Um, we just put the public um, the public keyword in front of the, the say hello. Now, what, what happens here is the public colon, everything that follows it until there's another, um, another uh, privacy um, keyword uh, will be public. So in other words, if I had two methods there, or I've used methods, but member functions um, that are that there say, where it says say hello and maybe something else, they would both be public. But because the greetee, um, the string is above uh, that public uh, keyword, it is private. So a, a, a key question, you know, might be, well, why, why, why bother with the capsulation? You know, um, it's, a, it, it's going to be a pain for me to define methods, you know, or, or member functions to access my data, you know, why, why don't I just make my, all my data public like we did with the struct for a complex number? Well, for, for, for simple types like complex numbers, that, 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 that's possibly fine. They're just, two, they're just two floating point numbers in effect. And you're just grouping them together to give you something that you can pass around as a, as a complete whole. Um, and there's no real complexity there. However, but in more complex types, we, we can enforce modularity um, 
by, or sometimes we can enforce modularity by using um, these protection uh, keywords, particularly the, you know, the, 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 the private, uh, making things private, so that we can swap out parts of the implementation um, for performance without having to rewrite the code. So let's say, for example, we had a complex um, type that uh, had some quite complex functions within it um, that, that update it or modify those, those values. If we just had access directly to the values and people were accessing the values rather than via a set of methods, it would be hard for us to, to swap, swap out that functionality for, more, uh, for a more um, performant version. And we don't have to rewrite the code. So, um, you know, if we call the method or the, or the member function on it, then that code that calls it stays the same, even though the implementation might change. But it just means that we, we, we constrain the scope of our change. Um, there are also other benefits to doing it, um, to protecting the data, um, that um, we can then control life cycles, as I mentioned earlier, of objects. Or I, I, when I say objects, I don't mean an instance of a class here. I, I mean other 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 um, sort of variables that have types. Um, you know, we can control their 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 um, life cycle much more easily if we have a set of methods than if we have everything public. We don't have that capability because we can't guarantee that somebody isn't going to access um, a member variable without going through a predefined interface. Also, um, I, I mentioned that there is um, a, an additional or another um, protect uh, um, protection modifier, I think they're called, um, which is protected, which um, allows uh, member variables in a, in a subclass um, to be accessed. So private means that they're private to the current class that's being defined. So if we were to so it, um, extend this class, create a subclass of it, which is one of the features of OO, object orientation, is that we have a hierarchy. We can create a class, then we can inherit from that. Um, so for example, we could create a subclass of ge uh, Greeter that did some extra functionality, but had all the features of Greeter. Um, by using protected, we can provide access to, um, to either member functions or to member, um, member variables. Whereas if they're, if, if they're private, um, the subclass can't see them, just in the same way as something outside the class can't see them. Now, um, that object onto design heuristics book calls out that you should, you, should, you, should, you should always make your data private, including for subclasses, and you should use protected methods to provide access to that, um, where um, you know, your methods should be protected as, um, by default rather than private and um, public. And this is all to do with decoupling um, the, 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 the code. And this is getting quite, quite deep, but basically you might hear people talk about, well, object orientation is complex. It's not great. We don't want to, you know, you don't want to use it. Um, you know, functional programming is the way to go. There are real issues with object orientation and, and inheritance. And certainly um, C++ supports multiple inheritance, which means you can inherit from two different base classes. And that does cause complexity. But some of these heuristics I'm pointing to do limit and reduce these issues that are generally being leveled at, at C++. But for now, I, 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 you don't need to worry about them. I'm just calling out that there are both benefits and drawbacks, and but there are, a, 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 there are ways of mitigating uh, some, of, some of these issues. And as I said, this controlled um, and partial relaxation of encapsulation helps to make the whole system we're, we're, we're creating um, more isolated. And I, I, as I said, I, 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 would, I would say that, um, that that book or, or other books that talk about object and design heuristics are things to think about when you're talking about building more complex classes and hierarchies. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll cover off constants. So it seems a bit strange to say that variables can be qualified with the cons keyword, but that, 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 that's, that's true. So uh, as it says, objects marked with const cannot be modified. 
and um, the compiler will give you errors if, if you try. Um, so this code here, we've declared the integer i um, as a constant value of 42, and we can happily print it out, but when we try to increment it, we, we get an error because it's, 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 it's a constant, so therefore we can't update it. And as it says here, we, we, we should really be adding const to local variables wherever possible. So that's wherever it, it, it's applicable to do so. Um, you know, obviously, if you, if you need to update the value, then that's, that it can't be const. Um, but uh, if it doesn't, then it shouldn't. It should be, it should, in other words, if, if you don't need to update it, it should be const. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail. checking uh, that's fine so an example of what i've just said there is if, if we know at the compile time we've got a particular value i don't know some value of pi then we we, we, we can set that to being a const uh, i will um, there's a question there uh, does const int or int const matter I'll, I'll cover that in a second it doesn't actually matter but i'll, I'll give you a reasoning behind different 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 uh, different structures there yeah I, th I think the, the key point here is um, using constants like this um, and giving them meaningful names you know um, for example something like local underscore mean underscore density rather than just say D means that we can get an idea and and when you think about writing code, there's a, there is a good argument for saying, well, comments are great, but actually your, com your code should be self-documenting. And one way to help with that is to ensure that we use meaningful names. So, you know, if we use meaningful names for both our variables and we make constants with meaningful names, then it, it makes our code more readable, but um, it actually, actually also helps it become uh, much more maintainable. Yeah, so since, <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, that function parameters are effectively local variables, they are, that's what they are, they're on the, what we call the stack, um, they can be const too. Um, so as we had the previous discussion, um, by passing complex const A and complex const B here, we're, 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 we're saying we're not going to modify these, and so we should mark it a const. It's good, it really is, Good practice to do this. Um, you know, we, we shouldn't. We if we don't need to modify something, then we we shouldn't be modifying it. And by using the const keyword, we can make that explicit. There could be compiler optimizations that could be done behind the scenes because it because of because of um, the fact that certain things are const. But one of the good the main reasons to do it is because um, it makes it clear that we're not going to update them and it also means that if you have a complex function I mean this operator is only one line but supposing this function was um, you know was, was quite a few hundred lines of code you may forget that these that these should be not modified and you may update it but by making it const the compiler will will tell you that it can update it because it's const so it helps you uh, ensure that you don't modify things that you really shouldn't be doing Yes, I mentioned this earlier. So um, this, this this implicit argument of the instance they belong to. So a member function for a class. In this case, it's a struct, but but it's it's, it's we'll call it a class because it because because that's the definition of something that defines objects. Um, has an implicit ar ar argument to the instance they belong to, i.e., the object they belong to. Um, and if they don't need to, so member functions don't need to change an instance, then it should be marked as const also. So basically we're, we're saying here that magnitude doesn't modify, doesn't modify the complex object that um, it, it, it's attached to. Um, and again, this, this is this um, 
this at this this point of its pass as the first parameter. But again, um, we don't really want to be accessing that directly unless we absolutely have to. So as as, as we just was mentioned there in the chat, um, which which layout do we use? You know, and what we've got here is called uh, east const or west const and east const. So we can see from from the, the language and from the compiler, they are they effectively they're identical. It doesn't it doesn't actually care. The compiler doesn't care which way around these are, um, and um, so we've got a, a, a rule that says, well, the const applies to what's on the left, unless there's nothing on the left, and then it applies to what's on its right. Well, so in this case, the const applies to the int. And um, then there's the, the other version where we put always put the const on the right of what it modifies, on the right of the int. Um, so it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent within a project. Well, the only thing I, I, I again, I don't, I don't want to talk about pointers too much, but in C, if we had a pointer um, i, supposing i was a pointer to an int, it would be int star i or int space star i. So in a sense, the modifier of the type in C goes on the right-hand side of the type itself. So in some ways, using int const makes more sense because it's you're modifying what that int is. Is it a constant or is it a constant binding to an int? So um, just like a pointer being a star or an asterisk, um, you know, it, it, it goes after the type. So I think, you know, you might, you, you could argue that the, 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 the one on the right here is, is, is perhaps more intuitive or what's known as East const. However, you'll definitely see older code bases, particularly, um, <laughs> and also older C++ programmers like myself who, Possibly we'll use const int because that was the convention early on um, with C++ to put the const at the beginning. So as mentioned, we, we will touch on references now and we'll have, we'll have a chat about references. So C++ is actually really rather nice in many ways. Um, when we um, when we um, assign a variable a new value, it'll copy it. So um, in this example here, double copy equals original. So the copy variable there gets a double value from the original. And we also get the same if you pass a value to a function. So it'll be copied to a new local variable when the, the function is called and we access that copy. As we see in the in the um, the advanced one time step function below. Now, <clears throat> the thing is, this is very beneficial, and it's great that we you know that C will do this for us. It will copy uh, objects, um, including classes and structs. So if you pass something like sim state, supposing sim state was it was a was a was an actual class. Um, it will copy that object. Um, and what that actually means, as I said earlier, we've got these, the, we've got these um, member functions that can be operators. We can actually define that as part of our interface. So we can say what actually happens when we copy it. Um, so why would you want to do that? Well, say you're doing some complex simulation like uh, computational fluid dynamics where the current state that you might be your, your there, the, the current state, the, the variable there, um, may be large. And so therefore it would be expensive, both in terms of time and memory to copy it. So we may actually not want to copy that. We may actually want to pass a reference. Um, and also if you call a function many, many times with um, passing it a uh, an object and then then it will create lots of copies of it. So that, uh, that, that, that hits performance. And also, if you think about it, you're, you're going to, you, you know, it, it's, 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 it, it, it may have memory implications as well. So C++ 
came up has come up with a concept and provides us with a reference. Now, C doesn't have a, a, a reference like this. It has pointers, which look very similar to references, but they are actually they're actually subtly different. Um, so, to introduce a reference, um, we use that ampersand, as I mentioned earlier, and we saw that example earlier. So, in, in scale vector there, in that in that in that um, function, we see that it takes a double, which is uh, name, you know, the scale, and then it takes a, a, a reference to a double vector from the standard library. Yeah, so that's with the ampersand. That, that's x. So x is a reference to a, a a double vector. And what's maybe not necessarily um, apparent is these um, angle angle brackets, the, the less than and greater than uh, symbols there, are used to uh, instantiate, as we call it, the, the vector class with a particular type. So it's like a template. And so what it's doing is, is, is it's basically, or it is a template in this case, I think, but you know, it's effectively creating uh, you know, a, a, a typed version of a vector. And in this case, it's double. And then the ampersand is telling us that we're going to be past one of those, and it's a reference to it rather than a copy of it. And because we're passing a reference, then the object that, or the reference that we're passing needs to be initialized. So you can't just declare a reference variable without initializing it. Yeah. So the, the, the kind of explanation we've, we've got is that um, at the call site, the reference is bound to the parameter and the function can refer to um, data in this example without copying it. So as you see there, we've got the standard vector in the test function. We've got the standard double uh, vector and um, we're putting a variable of data and we're passing that in. So it's been initialized and uh, we're then passing that reference in, not copying it. Um, it calls out that this is close to the way that Fortran passes arguments to subroutines. You can qualify the reference, as mentioned earlier, you can qualify the reference as const. So that's how we do it. We've got sim state there, it's a const, and then the ampersand, so it's a const reference. It's quite nice to put it that way because then you can see it is a const reference. So it's a reference to, you know, that can't be changed. Um, and old is, is that const reference that we're passing into, into the function. So the compiler will give an error if you try to change it or call a function that tries to change it. So not only if you say old equals something else, will it give an, uh, an error, but if you pass it to a function that then tries to update it, it will, it will give you an error as well because the, the C++ compiler can trace the constness, as we call it, all the way through the, the call tree, which is, which is really quite powerful. And you'll get an error, a compiler error. So we can pass references to functions, but we can also return uh, references from, from, from a function. And um, we, we often want to do this when we want to give access to some member variable, but um, we, we want to do that and if the, um, without copying it when it's it's a large if it's a large a large data structure. So, in this example here, atom list the class um, everything's private apart from the get charge member function, which it's it's quite it's quite a line to read. And sometimes C plus plus when you look at when you look at these kind of lines which use you know functions from a standard library use a template use a uh, constant or, and a reference, it, it, it can it can look like quite a lot of quite a lot of, quite a lot of word salad there. But what it's actually saying is um, we're going to return a constant reference to a double vector, a vector of doubles. You know that you know the standard uh, in the standard library. But we're also saying that um, not only that, but the function itself is const. So in other words, get charge won't change that 
vector charge and it also returns a constant reference to it. Now, the advantage of this is that um, the compiler will check if anybody tries to tries to update that reference that we've been handed back and will complain. So you, 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 you're, you're protecting the, uh, the access to that vector. Somebody can, you know, you can write a function as we see further down, analyze underscore MD data can, can actually um, get access to the, um, the, 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 the actual data, but they, they can't modify it, which enhances um, what we were talking about with regards encapsulation and ensures that if this was an object that is used by a number of different routines, we were not going to get a side effect by somebody modifying the internal, internal value of, of our class without us knowing through a, a set of predefined interfaces. So an example here, when we call the get charge, the local variable charges refers to the data contained within atoms. And as I said, it's done without any, any copying. Uh, returning references is very common, um, especially for containers, which we'll talk about uh, later on. Oh, there's a question. Ah, yes, I, I thought I had explained that. Um, sorry, the question was, um, uh, can I explain what the second const is in the get charge void um, a function definition? That, that second const, the one at the end, um, actually says that get charge doesn't modify the internal representation of the uh, of 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 the of the class the object. So I'll, I'll just go back up to that slide. So what it means is, oops, this const that I've highlighted here doesn't modify these. Yeah, and this. I probably went too fast over this. I apologize. This here is is the, is is saying that what I return in charge is constant. Okay. So we can use references, and we can use const with auto, and we have some examples here. So um, if we say auto x or whatever it is, we'll, we'll get a modifiable copy. That, that's a variable that we can update. If we use auto double ampersand, that's not a mistake, they are double ampersands, and then X, when you want a reference and you want the same, what I was talking about, constness as the initializer. So in other words, if, if the initializer, which could be a function, uh, returns a constant, then you'll get a constant. If it returns uh, a non-const or a variable, then you, you, you'll get that. And that just says that I don't need to worry about it. It'll be automatically done for me. If on the other hand, you say auto const reference X or ampersand X, then you reference the original item and you will not modify it. So you're, you're making a statement that no matter what you're passed back or, you're in, or what you're passed to, to, to initialize it, you're not going to modify it. You're, you know, um, you're, going to, you're going to maybe call uh, member functions um, to access the data and give you some values, but you're not going to actually modify it. And uh, as the big thumbs up says here, um, we want to use the last version whenever possible. So as often as possible, we should we should make everything const and we should use constant references unless unless we're actually going to um, have to update what 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 we're point um, what we're referencing. And Elise pointed to there. No, we're not talking pointers, references, what we're referencing. And by the way, a non-const reference, we, we would call a mutable reference. So um, effectively, uh, if auto amp, I'm sorry, I'm just asking a question. Would auto ampersand X result in an error? No, I, I no, because it, because uh, I wouldn't think so. Um, but... 
No, it's just a, it just has a, d a different meaning. Uh, sorry, I'm slightly, I'm slightly hazy. I'm I would, I would always use auto X when I just want to get a, a, an actual modifile copy of the, of, of the thing. When I want to use a reference, I would always use auto ampersand ampersand anyway, and allow the allow what is the in, um, is instantiating or initializing my object to 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 determine the const. So I, I would suggest you always use auto ampersand ampersand X or const ampersand X when you want to get a reference, and prefer to use the auto const ampersand X when um when you can when you know that you're not going to have data is that correct if i were on i thought i was running to one let me just check Yes, my understanding is we're running to one o'clock. Oh, okay. Well, we've we've only got um, a couple of slides to go. Just just give me a second. Okay, I'll just, I'll, <laughs> sorry, Juan, can you confirm whether it's 1 or, or 12.30, in which case I'll, I'll wrap up if it's I mean, uh, uh, The thing is, uh, uh, yeah, the, the mail was uh, sent uh, by mistake uh, 12.30, so, uh, but I don't know if uh, people are happy to uh, stay a few minutes more and finish this lesson or, uh, I mean, I will, I will finish this uh, lesson and then also this is a recorded uh, so uh, uh, you can have a look uh, later at the recording in case that uh, you need to leave it there now. So I I, I will continue on and close with the session if that's okay. Yep. Sorry for Great. the miss up about the, the finishing time. No, no problem at all. I, I mean, I can quickly actually we'll rattle through the, the next set of slides and um, we don't need to worry too much about the exercise. We, you can, you, we can do that in our own time. Um, so I'll, I'll just, I'll just quickly go on a bit more about, um, as I say, about compilation. So um, you'll hear me talking a lot about declaration and definition, and sometimes I will mix them up. Um, but, as it says here, it's quite clear. A declaration tells the compiler that a name exists, what its type is, um, what it refers to. In other words, if it's a function or a variable, you know, it, it, its type. And um, as it says, for most uses, this is this is this is all that the compiler needs. Um, they can be re repeated as long as they match exactly. I'll say a bit more about this in a second. A definition tells the compiler everything it needs to create, can create something that in its entirety. Um, as it says, a definition is also really a declaration. But uh, the one definition rule says that definitions must not be repeated without an exception. So what, what does this mean? You, well, when I was talking earlier about um, the header files and the body files or implementation files, um, we should put our declarations um, of functions, our definitions of classes and global constants in our header files. And as I said, their common suffixes are .hpp, .h, 
in capital .h, although I'd recommend using .hpp. The definitions of most functions should be in the implementation files. So again, the common suffixes there are .cpp, .cxx, .cc, or .capital C. Again, I would tend to prefer .cpp. Headers can also be hash include um, into other files. So in other words, we can, we, can, we, can, we can include other files that we need to use the type. So I mentioned that earlier. So if we put the information there that's at the top, function, declarations of functions, the definition of classes and global constants in a header file, when we want to reuse the code, we can include that in another system, another module, another set of codes, and uh, we can then link it together um, with, the, with the CPP file to, to you know, the object file that gets created from that to, to allow us to, to reuse the functionality. So I should point out the compiler doesn't really care the difference between an HPP and a .cpp file um, in terms of what's a header and what's a, 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 an implementation file. Um, we'll see that later, we won't be discussing modules in, on this course, but if you were to look at um, modules, um, this, this clears up this, this ambig ambiguity because some people say, well, C++ does have this sort of modular but it, 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 it's, it's informal in the way it goes about it by how we manage our header files and how we manage our implementation files. Now, um, if you had uh, declared your or definitions of your classes and your, me your member functions or methods were not um, in line, effectively they were separate and used the um, scope resolu uh, uh, re resolution syntax, then you would put those in your implementation file in your CPP file. So here's an example. If we were de declaring our header file for our complex number, um, then it would look something like this. So we'd have the struct and we would have uh, the, um, the, the definition for it. And we've got there um, the default constructor and then we've got the two private um, notice in this case, what we've now done, because we use struct, um, the, we have to use the private keyword to uh, hide or, you know, the, 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 the two data elements, the real and imaginary, imaginary. And then we're actually giving the um, declaration of the, of the operator. It's not, it's not the implementation of it, but it's, it's effectively, it's protocol or, or, um, signature. In other words, what, when, I, when I talk about a signature of, of a function, I'm talking about its return type and its parameter types, the number of parameters and the parameter types. And as we see here, that's what this is, because the semicolon in the end shows that we don't have any, it's not, it's not actually being defined. We're not actually seeing the implementation of it. That would be in the, in the CPP file. Now, if you're, if you're a C programmer, th this will look familiar to you in terms of the, these, these um, hash if def. Uh, statements, these macro uh, statements here, um, what this does, and this is a convention. So by convention, uh, you uppercase you, the name of the file. So in this case, it would be complex.hpp. And you create what we call these guard uh, statements. So, so what this does is it, you can include a, a file multiple times. So you can do a hash include multiple times. And um, C++ won't, won't care, neither will C, and it will just load it multiple times. But um, that's not very helpful because you'll get compiler errors because, because it, 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 if you have multiple um, versions of, of, of copies of this in, your, in your, your, your implementation or your C file that wants to use it. So the way we get around it is to use these guard statements. Basically, it says if, if, if this, um, if you like, uh, macro variable um, is not defined, then define it. And not only do you define it, but you then we get the, the actual code. But if it's already defined, then nothing happens. It includes the file, but because there's nothing, there's no else, it just it, it just gives you, it just includes empty space, if you like. And so therefore you, you don't find, you, you won't get the errors that you would get if you, um, if you, if you included that more than once. So that, that's, that's a way of, of protecting us. Back to what I said about, 
you know, in terms of the kind of modularity in, in, in C and you know and C plus um, plus is 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 kind of um, by convention rather than by any form of mechanism. But uh, the C I think C plus plus twenty three modules um, make that much more formal. And that was just to that was just to um, go through the exercise to try them out um, and run the tests. So that says, um, are there any questions? Any any other questions you would like to ask, or anything you would like me to go back over and quickly uh, cover again? Just to clarify for the exercises, the idea if uh, if you have time yeah, in the afternoon, uh, you can have a look at them. And uh, tomorrow we will have uh, more time for uh, exercises uh, during the lesson, so uh, you can ask uh, questions about them or uh, clarifications. Also, if you have uh, any questions about uh, today's uh, material, we can solve them uh, tomorrow. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, sorry again for uh, overrunning the the thing. Is uh, yeah, we have like uh, for some courses uh, we finish at half past twelve, for others at uh, one p.m. So that was like the confusion. But anyway, this is a recorded. So for the people who uh, left, who had to left at, at uh, half past 12, they will be able to uh, uh, play this again and see what was uh, uh, explained. Okay, I see that there are no questions. So, so uh, thanks everyone for attending today. Thanks, uh, Maurice, uh, for uh, giving the introduction to C++. It has been uh, uh, very uh, useful and um, very interesting to learn a little bit more about uh, this language. And uh, see you tomorrow at uh, half, past, uh, uh, half past nine. Uh, have a nice uh, rest of the day. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.